Okay, I think we'll start. Thanks everyone for coming and also for those who are on Zoom um, to this uh, seminar that I'm really looking forward to actually. So, um, but before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Ghana country and acknowledge elders past and present and also acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders in the room today. And so it actually gives me great pleasure to introduce Ed Robbins. Ed hasn't been with us for, for very long, um, but we're really pleased to recruit Ed to, to Mitru. Um, and just a little bit of background on Ed. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Honours in Chemistry at the University of Newcastle on Tyne in 1994, and then uh, got his PhD in the School of Chemistry at Bristol University in 1997. After five years of postdoc studies, he joined Imaging Research Solutions Limited at Hammersmith Hospital in the UK as a radiochemist in 2003. And then between 2007 and 2011, Ed was the radiochemistry leader for medical diagnostics discovery at General Electric Healthcare or GE Healthcare, um, during which time his work was focused on the discovery, development and translation of pet radiopharmaceuticals from basic research to clinical research and commercialization. In 2011, Ed moved to Singapore and was the head of radiochemistry at Singapore Bioimaging Consortium um, and concurrently held a joint appointment with Clinical Imaging Research Centre at National University of Singapore. And, uh, he then became Deputy Director and Head of Radiochemistry for the Clinical Imaging Research Centre at the National University. And then finally, he saw the light and after being at places like Hammersmith and National University of Singapore, he discovered SAMRI and, uh, and joined SAMRI, which has been fantastic. And he joined Mitru um, as Head of Research and Development at, uh, at Mitru and uh, has really fitted in very well and lots of exciting things have been happening. So I'm really hope, looking forward to hearing what Ed's got to say. Thank you for joining us, Ed. Thank you very much indeed for the very kind introduction. Sorry, I knew I was gonna make a mess of this somehow. Right. Um, okay, so it's my pleasure to talk to you all today. Um, I hope this isn't a bit too self-indulgent. It's going to be a bit of a tour of what I've been doing and some of the things I've been doing. Um, as this is my first presentation in front of everybody, I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the land. Um, and also like to say thank you to everyone at Samri for making me feel so welcome here. Um, I arrived in November from Singapore with a little gap in between, uh, leaving Singapore and arriving in Australia. Um, but I'm delighted to be here and I'll, I'd like to share with you some of what I've done and hopefully some plans going forward. So this is a short overview of what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, first of all, a little bit about me again. You've heard a little bit from Steve. Um, and then I'm going to sort of introduce you to some of the ideas behind molecular imaging and positron emission tomography in particular. Um, I can't start a talk um, without mentioning FDG. It is the radio pharmaceutical that we're going up against constantly. Uh, there have been a number of developments lately uh, that look like they may be able to replace FDG as a clinical standard one day, but that will take a very, very long time. Um, but I'll also go on to explain why um, that might be an important thing to do. Uh, and then ultimately talk about um, Mitru and some of the plans that we have in place and some of the things I would like to put in place going forward. Okay, so again, about me. So as you can see, again, chemistry, chemist by training. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 2003 when I joined Hammersmith that I really taken a big interest in the application of chemistry to, uh, to bio biology. I had many, many years prior been interested in working at a nuclear reactor up in the northwest of England. Um, I went to interview, I thought I did a great job, I didn't get it, so I went and post instead uh, and carried on synthetic organometallic chemistry, um, where a lot of those experiences actually helped me when I got to Hammersmith, um, because my postdoc career, although it's not really mentioned here, actually took me through many, many different um, 
chemistry disciplines, from catalysis to materials chemistry to new materials chemistry, um, which gave me a sort of an idea of how to apply what I'd learned before to a sort of a new area. So when I got to Hammersmith and I saw my papers laid out across the desk at the interview, um, I was one, extremely nervous they were going to ask me questions about them, which they did. Thankfully, I was able to remember the, uh, the papers. I hope I'm going to remember some of the work that I'm going to present to you just as well today. Um, but that really encouraged me to actually apply new methods, new uh, procedures to radio pharmaceutical challenges. Um, and through time, got the opportunity to go to, uh, to Singapore. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about this morning was done in, work done in Singapore. Um, it looks like a long list of different appointments. Actually, I joined one organization, got a joint appointment, another organization, and as the organization changed and my role changed, I actually pretty much felt like I stayed in the same place. But I'll give you a, an overview of the two facilities that I, I spent most time in in Singapore. So first is Singapore Bioimaging Consortium. So this was an imaging unit within the Biomedical Research uh, Council of ASTAR, ASTAR being the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore. So it's a government funded agency. It's SAMRI plus in a sense, in that there's so many research institutes within ASTAR. Uh, there's a science and engineering uh, and a biomedical research component to these. Um, and we were just one of 20 odd institutes within that organization. Uh, the Clinical Imaging Research Center, not the Clinical Research Imaging Center, which we find next door, um, was actually a joint venture initially between the university um, and ASTAR, uh, who put in funds to build a clinical imaging research facility, uh, complete with cyclotron and clean room manufacturing facility. And whilst this picture shows a lovely building, uh, of course, we were down in the basement, as indeed is Mitru, out of the way, uh, doing work with, uh, and no one really gets to see us. So it's nice to be uh, in front of you today. So what we built in Singapore for preclinical and clinical, clinical uh, imaging was preclinical imaging radiochemistry lab. So this is a non-GMP facility where we could actually go in, do research, and not be bound by this, this three-letter acronym, GMP, Good Manufacturing Practice, which actually covers everything that is done downstairs. Um, and everything that we did in our clean room facility. Now, when it comes to radio, manufacturing radio pharmaceuticals for human use, GMP is essential. Okay, it is, as with any pharmaceutical, a standard by which we actually have to achieve to actually be able to safely inject radio pharmaceuticals or pharmaceuticals into human beings. Um, and so, when it comes to preclinical, you still want to do excellent characterization and understand what you're putting in to understand the images that you're going to get out. But ultimately, um, we are less bound by the rules and regulations that we need to actually achieve and the quality standards we need to achieve. However, garbage in, garbage out is still, uh, still a truth. And preclinically, we had several, sorry, uh, several scanners uh, for PET CT and PET MR. And clinically, we had the same. We had it, sorry, I'll get out of your way. Uh, we had PET CT and PET MR. So we really felt we had a translational capability to go from early phase research all the way through to the clinic. And some of that de development work I'll talk about today. So this is just a, a timeline. I hope you can read this uh, reasonably well. Um, and I, again, this is the slightly self-indulgent part. So in 2011, I arrived in, in Singapore, uh, right at the time that the building that we put our facility in was actually completed. Um, I say completed because in the basement, actually it was just a hole in the ground. Literally, you could open a door and there was nothing but a hole. And that space was to be our radiochemistry and cyclotron facility. Oops. Our construction began in 2012 and we officially opened by our Deputy Prime Minister, or the Singapore Deputy Prime Minister, in 2015. So it took three years, essentially. Now, three years sounds a very long time to construct a facility. Um, I haven't seen many facilities that were constructed much quicker than that. I think Mitro is pretty close, actually. 
actually. Um, but around the world, the, the, uh, the, manner, the put, putting together of these clinical imaging facilities with clean room facilities for manufacturing can often take significant lengths of time. And we had many disruptions whilst we were putting our facility together. Not least, I was looking for a space uh, to do for our preclinical radiochemistry lab, uh, which actually ended up in the same building. Uh, but when I first got to Singapore, um, everyone was delighted to have me there and delighted that you're going to be doing this research, but please don't do that research anywhere near me because it's radioactive and therefore it's dangerous. Um, so thankfully, we found a space within the clinical imaging research facility where we could actually set up our labs. So we we're actually right on site of the cyclotron, right next door to the clean room facility. Uh, so we were perfectly positioned. However, our imaging facility was about a couple of miles away up the road at, at Biopolis at ASTAR, um, which creates some logistical difficulties, but this is not any kind of logistical difficulty that is faced by Mitru downstairs. So Mitru delivers interstate. Now, I'm sure you all have a very good appreciation for how big Australia is. Uh, maybe you don't have an appreciation for how small Singapore is. I think it's about 40 miles square. So talking about moving radio pharmaceuticals a couple of miles up the road and back again, that was difficult for us. So I'm not even going to complain about how uh, that anymore because I can't imagine how difficult logistically getting radio pharmaceuticals around this country is. And yet Mitru does it. Okay. So, um, where are we in the timeline? So yes, once we had officially opened in 2015, it wasn't long before we actually did our first human subject. And this was a, a radio pharmaceutical called PIB, or carbon-11 PIB, Pittsburgh Interesting Compound B. It's a carbon-11 labeled compound. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and it labels amyloid plaques in the brain. It's actually been developed a long time ago, uh, but it was our first uh, radio pharmaceutical that we produced, and that was done in April 2016. Um, and it wasn't until 2018 that we actually felt comfortable enough to go to our local authority. HSA in Singapore is TGA here. Uh, they actually, they came in, they audited us for our compliance to good manufacturing practice, which covers every aspect of what we do. So from control of process, control of facilities, control of people, uh, control of materials and uh, equipment. And, and if you can think about what we do downstairs, every aspect of that has to be documented and maintained and continually reviewed and improved to all a improvement of all our processes. This happens downstairs in Metro. This is a massive undertaking. And so, when 2020 came around and everybody stopped, we weren't able to stop. We did, we did actually stop, um, but we didn't stop our key activities. Mitru carried on manufacturing throughout uh, COVID and throughout what we called in Singapore circuit breaker, but this sort of global shutdown. But we still needed to make sure that we had uh, clean room facilities that were clean and continually clean. This is an, our environmental control is, is key to being able to produce a product of sufficient quality for injection into human beings. And just shutting the door and closing the facility and coming back, hopefully when COVID's over, it was not the answer. So we had, a, there was a lot of difficulties in persuading people to actually allow us to go back in and keep the facility uh, to specification. Once we had got to August in 2020, we had managed to make arguments that some of the, the programs that we were running at CIRC, um, the clinical programs, were actually more valuable to the, the, the subjects uh, that we do carry on with them than, so we were able to restart our, our manufacturing and restart our scanning again. And then as we go through the year, as we go through to 2021, we start getting more and more projects coming online. Uh, through 21 to 22, more projects still. Um, please don't worry about all these things. But what we started to do is start to rapidly 
ramp up our operations until oops, July uh, 2022. Um, I decided that I was going to be leaving Singapore because I had an opportunity to come to Mitru and to Samri. And in November last year, I arrived. So as I said, delighted to be here. I've had a lot of experience with a facility in Singapore, uh, but we were set up specifically to do research. We didn't have the, the manufacturing uh, responsibility that Mitru has, which is to produce a radio pharmaceutical called FT, FDG, which is almost a, it is a clinical standard and it is the, by far and away the most important pet radio pharmaceutical. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But where are we on the molecular imaging spectrum? Typically, we're in the range of millimeters to centimeter in terms of what we can, uh, uh, the, the resolution that PET offers. That coupled with MR or CT can give beautiful co-registered images of high quality, high resolution, as well as um, you can see where your PET radio pharmaceutical actually is. And I'll talk about that in a sec. But you can see from this article uh, in 20, uh, 1996, that PET was really just about metabolic pathways. It is actually so much more than that now. So, nuclear imaging, it's a medical speciality involving radio pharmaceuticals. So ra pharmaceuticals radio labeled with radi radioactive isotopes. Positron emission tomography, particular uh, isotopes used as typically cyclotron generated and now used in the diagnosing, staging and, and monitoring of therapy. Um, and so it goes from manufacturing, radio labeling, and into positron emission tomography. And what is positron emission tomography? As mentioned, it uses radioactive labeled drug-like molecules. When the cyclotron produced isotope decays, it emits a positron, which when it meets an electron, annihilates. Uh, from that annihilation, you get two gamma photons. Gamma photons can be picked up on a line of response you do this millions of times and you can actually recreate a three-dimensional image of where that, that radioisotope has been in 3D space. So you can build up a, a tomographic image and distribution in living body of where your isotope is and therefore where your radio-labeled molecule is. Now, if your radio-labeled molecule has a particular function, then you can start to assess biochemical function in vivo. And these are the sort of isotopes that are used uh, for positron emission tomography. And the, the starred isotopes are the ones that we actually have currently available at MITRU. Uh, we hope very much that this list to be expanded. Um, but as I mentioned, one of the first compounds that we did in Singapore was carbon-11 PIB. And yet, it's not typically used here at MITRU, although we have the capability. Um, Part of that is, if I talk about logistics of fluorine 18 with a half-life of 109 minutes, you can only imagine that a half-life of 20 minutes means you have to do the manufacture, the quality control and release of your product, all within a, a few half-lives, and maybe only two half-lives, which is only 40 minutes in this case, and then get your tracer to your subject on the scanner to be scanned you can only really do carbon-11 chemistry, there are caveats of course, but when you have the scanners on, on the same site as you do your manufacturing. Although, obviously next door we have a scanner, so logistically it will be challenging, however, I don't think it will be impossible. So, where to start uh, when developing uh, preclinical imaging uh, and translating that into the clinic? So typically you start with a bio biochemical problem or a process that you're interested in. You identify molecular targets and then you think about which modality is best for you. Now there are a number of different imaging modalities. I'm gonna to talk to you about positron emission tomography, um, but there are a number of different modalities which each have their own pros and cons. Once you've decided which imaging modality is, is useful for you, there's, there's often some chemistry involved, radio labeling perhaps, looking at in vitro cell assays to understand that your molecule does interact with your biochemical process or function as you expect it to, 
small animal studies, uh, large animal studies, and this is uh, particularly pertinent now that we have done our first dummy run transfer uh, of activity from Metru downstairs to Pearl over in Gillies Plain, so that we do have a study uh, lined up, uh, which will be the first study, as I understand, where we're transferring radiopharmaceuticals to a sheep model of Huntington's disease, um, and that is going to be taking place this year. From large animals and imaging through to computational modeling, clinical imaging, and ultimately clinical practice is where the hope. So what targets do we what targets do we choose to, to look for? Well, it entirely depends upon the process you're interested in. And this diagram here really shows that the vast majority, a large number of different types of target that you could possibly conceive of. Um, the one I'll mention first is FDG. Um, FDG fluorodeoxyglucose is, as I mentioned, the, the quintessential pet radiopharmaceutical. And really what you're looking at here with FDG is the glute, glute, uh, glucose transporter. That's what you're looking at, GLUT1. You could think about other receptors. You could take a molecule, a, a ligand that binds to a particular receptor that you're interested in, radio label it and actually target that receptor in vivo. You look at transporters, you look at enzyme activity, amino acid synthesis, there's, there's an also a lot, a lot of different types of target that we can, we can actually access using PET and other imaging modalities. And of course, when you go through the development process, it's very much like drug development. Um, so many of the same desirable um, characteristics for PET radiopharmaceuticals you'll find in many drugs. Um, possibly not oral by availability, because they're typically in the intravenously injected. However, um, because many, many drugs fail for that reason, they can actually potentially be highly useful pet radiopharmaceuticals. However, drugs and, and drug pipeline, which looks very similar to this, obviously with product launch being a, a dream at the end, but tracers and, radio and pharmaceuticals have a high attrition rate that and they, and they basically, you can fail at a number of different steps. And even within the basic research portion, you need to understand your biology and your biochemistry to really understand how to, do, how to build your radiopharmaceutical. And you can fail at many, many different steps within this process. Um, but the choice of radioisotope that you use can often dictate the type of chemistry that you're going to do. And the choice of radioisotope can often be dictated by the biological process. So if you've got something that happens really very slowly, or you're looking at labeling a large molecule, then you're going to need a long-lived isotope to actually be able to follow that molecule in vivo. If you're looking for something smaller, uh, that happens a little bit more quickly, then hopefully you can use some of the shorter-lived isotopes. So depending upon what you look, want to look at, it will dictate the choice of isotope that you're wanting to, look at, to, to use. And again, the different isotopes and the different molecular frameworks that you can use are, are really up to your imagination. So there's a vast array of different types of molecule that can be radio labeled. And there's an array of different isotopes that will suit different molecules. And then, as I mentioned at the flagship the other day, this is the, uh, the idea that ultimately we start with a biological question. We have chemistry, biology, and imaging strategies, manufacturing, preclinical imaging, analysis, hopefully success, and then hopefully translating that ultimately into clinical trial and, and and, and beyond. So, with that all said, what are we going up against when we want to develop new radiopharmaceuticals? And typically it's this FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. Um, it's the single most important pet radiopharmaceutical. Um, it's an analogue of glucose and it is susceptible to phosphorylation. Um, however, only once. Once phosphorylated, uh, once FDG enters the cell through GLUT1, Hexakinase phosphorylates to this intermediate product, but typically this is not reversible. Typically, there are occasions when that's not true. And so your radioisotope and your radio label molecule gets trapped within that cell. Um, and that 
ultimately leads you to your positive PET signal. So this is why um, FDG has been used so significantly in cancer diagnosis and, and therapy monitoring, um, because typically uh, cancer cells take up glucose more readily than the surrounding cells, and therefore and then gets trapped. There are exceptions to that. Um, but according to EANM from uh, or the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and the Society, Society of Nuclear Medicine and now Molecular Imaging, the uses of the clinical use of FDG is extensive. So it can look at extensive disease, tumor recurrence, uh, look at metastatic disease, identify uh, primary and identify metastases, look at evaluating response, guidance, surgical planning, and therapy planning. However, it can be misinterpreted. FDG does not in, in accumulate only in tumor cells. It can accumulate in, in areas of inflammation, tissue healing, etc. Um, and I'll show you an example in immunotherapy where actually FDG accumulation does not associate itself with the, the, the current resist uh, criteria, do not demonstrate positive. Uh, a, 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 sorry, a correct image and uh, interpretation. Um, so the other thing is in regions where FDG is and glucose is rapidly taken up normally, such as the brain, uh, actually looking for signal is very difficult uh, because of the surrounding area is also very, very FDG avid. Um, in fact, I went for a PET scan myself a few years ago um, and they could tell that I'd been chewing gum because actually my jaw lit up um, on the scan. So FDG is not tumor specific. It does measure uh, glucose uptake. And from that, you can infer, depending on what you're looking for, what FDG is actually showing you. <coughs> so given that FDG is good, it's not great, what do we do to try and... Uh, Try and improve upon it if possible. Obviously. So one area where FDG has not been really working very particularly well is cancer immunotherapy and looking at response to cancer immunotherapy. Now I say it's not been working particularly well, however, as I mentioned, um, typically the resist criteria, clinical criteria that show um, or guide a clinician to understand what the FDG image is actually telling them. Um, now, RESIST itself has been adapted uh, to include immuno, uh, the use of FDG in immunotherapy. And the reason for this is because clinicians typically like a tool they, are, they feel they understand. However, um, because what we're trying to do is, and I'll show you, what we're trying to do is actually uh, activate the body's own immune system to fight your own cancer you're looking for infiltration of cells that are actually going to be taking up FDG. So you're going to look for, you're going to look or get a signal for your cancer that is actually increasing rather than decreasing. So is that tumor growth or is that response to therapy? And so from the imaging, you really can't tell. So the idea behind the cancer immunotherapy imaging program in Singapore was can we develop imaging biomarkers that will actually enable us to to definitively identify tumors that are responding from those that are non-responding um, to therapy. Now, the IFPP is an industry alignment pre-positioning fund. It's a Singapore grant mechanism that really looks for large collaborations. And as you can see, this was a collaboration across both hospitals and research institutes across Singapore. Um, at the time, Singapore Bioimaging and Clinical Imaging Research Centre were the two that I was associated with, but you can see there's an awful lot of other people involved in this programme. Um, and we, we were both involved by leading the biology theme, and I was involved in leading the radiochemistry theme for this programme. The whole idea is to be able to develop new imaging approaches to actually stratify patients and subjects who are responding to therapy. So, as mentioned, it's a radical shift in cancer treatment capable of treating your own cancer with your, through your own activation of your own immune system. Um, however, oh, wrong button. At the start of therapy, 
you don't know if you're with, even though in this instance what we're showing is actually active ther activation of the immune system and response to therapy. What's happening here is your FDG signal is going up and up and up. Um, and at this point, you don't, size of the tumor is no longer, an uptake of FTG is no longer a good indication of whether you're actually getting response to therapy or that tumor is getting worse. So as part of the program, we looked for different types of molecule that we wanted to, to use. Now, we could have gone with small molecules, but there's a problem with the, uh, the de designing molecules with the right affinity, selectivity, um, all the advantages of antibodies and large, large molecules. However, uh, there's no chance of immunogenicity, uh, there's high tissue penetration, and the relative cost of small molecule manufacture is small. So small molecules have a good, a good you know, a few good, a good uh, parts to them, but a few, uh, few parts that are not so optimal. Similarly, biologics are almost the op equal and opposite. So there is the, opposite, the opportunity for immunogenicity, so reaction. Uh, tissue penetration is not so good. They have a very long biological half-life. Um, so maybe if you're going to label large molecules, you'll need longer lived isotopes. So we settled on peptides, which we believed at the time had sort of the perfect characteristics for radio labeling uh, from a synthetic point of view, they're, they're manufacturable. We can design in the radio labeling strategy. And of course, then we have to think about what targets to you to look for. Well, CD8 and CD4 cell populations are common in the literature as targets to look at the whole uh, immune system and the whole body immune system. PDL1, uh, program death ligand one, tumor cell marker that stratify patients. The idea is to be able to stratify patients that actually will be suitable for PD1, PDL1 therapy. What we settled on as part of our portion of this program was granzyme B. Now from the literature, granzyme B is a downstream serine protease, which is a factor of CD8 positive T cells. So the, the CD8 T, the T cells that actually go in and kill your tumor cells. So rather than look at CD8 per se, the presence of which may not actually indicate that you're responding to therapy. They may just be present. We're looking for a downstream effect of cytotoxic T cells. Uh, so once CD8 becomes activated um, and is, res is responding to, and you're responding to therapy, it's simply because of the, the release of granzyme B and perforin and others. others. Um, so by measuring granzyme B, we feel that we've got a, a decent measure of response uh, to activated CD8 T cells. So we put together an animal model. In this case, it was a colon cancer model. And what we saw by treatment and measuring the size of the tumor over a number of days, uh, and we treated with anti pd one as well as combinations of CTLA-4 uh, and, and PD-1, is we saw a distribution um, between response and non-response. And this is exactly the sort of situation you'll come across in the clinic, where some people will respond and some people won't respond to therapy. And so in our animals, um, we did get non-responders, which are here in blue and black are the controls, whereas response to PD-1 alone is in red and response to the combination is here in green. So we have a model that seemingly mirrors what's going on in the clinic in that some people will respond, some people won't. Um, this is perfect for us because now we want to understand whether we can differentiate these through imaging. So one of the things, we, the first thing we did is we wanted to have a look at a range of different radiopharmaceuticals, quintessential FDG. So we wanted to see if FDG was going to be suitable. We hoped it wasn't going to be. We didn't believe it. And everything I've told you so far suggests that it's not going to be suitable for differentiating. FEPPA. FEPPA is a TSPO ligand. Um, it's not GE180. It's probably a little better. The reason I mention that is because I worked on GE180 in 2006. Um, interleukin-2 uh, for CD25 positive cells. And this was a literature compound peptide that was targeted toward a, as a substrate of granzyme B. Okay, so we wanted to assess these four pet radiopharmaceuticals 
in our colon cancer model. There we go. And see what we saw. So with FDG, basically what we have, apologies, so white is the vehicle, PD-1 was uh, here treated, PD-1, CTLA-4 combination treated, and non-responding. So really, judging by this, you really couldn't make many conclusions at all from this imaging. If we look at IL-2, um, again, you're looking at activated T cells, but in this particular model, again, you see no real significant differences between the, between the different imaging agents and the different therapy groups. FEPPA, with the idea of looking at activated macrophages, which should, of course, also be um, uh, uh, recruited to the site of, uh, of uh, the tumor, again, it was really very difficult to see and make any comparison as, uh, or make any sensible judgment as to what we were seeing. And then, thankfully, Granzyme B. So if we look at the vehicle and the non-responders, they look very similar. We see a small increase in the terms of PD-1, where we're getting a small uh, response. But in the combination uh, therapy, where we do see response and significant response, we actually got a much higher signal. Just want to, the, for those of you interested in imaging, just have a quick look at that number there, 0.6. Okay, it's important. Um, and I'll explain why. But this was our, this was our key result. Uh, for the project, because now we know we've got a target that we want to look at, we want to evaluate, and we've got a molecule, at least a lead. Now that lead wasn't ours, it came from the literature. Um, but if we've got a molecular lead, then there's, there's things that we can do from a chemistry point of view, a radiochemistry point of view, to try and optimize and improve the characteristics. And just from an imaging point of view, if we just have a look at a non-responder, this is the, the granzyme B peptide, labeled with gallium-68 in this case, and you really see not, not a lot of uptake in the tumor site here. Um, this is a PD-1 responder. You're starting to see uptake of the radiopharmaceutical in the tumor, and then where you have response to a combination therapy, you get significant up, uptake of the granzyme B, so that uh, radiopharmaceutical, or at least it's the peptide, that binds to granzyme B. So in this case, it really truly is responding. So, and in the case of FDG, this is a responder. However, the non-responder will look very much the same. Uh, when it comes to interleukin-2, um, you really didn't see anything. And this is from a responding animal. And then FEPPA, again, we really didn't see too much. This is a TSPO, so the macrophage imaging agent. Um, now, from that initial study, we then actually went on to, do, first of all, due to the accessibility of gallium, which typically comes not from a cyclotron, but more commonly from a generator, um, we didn't have access to a generator, so we developed, a, we, or we adapted some chemistry to use aluminium fluoride as our, our, our labeling agent, same chelator, uh, this time aluminium bound to 18F, fluorine 18, which gives us a slightly longer half-life to play with. Um, in fact, the imaging is slightly better, um, but it allowed us to move on and have a look at whether this peptide could then stratify to combinations of immune, immune checkpoint inhibitors. We also looked at with a, a combination of chemotherapeutics, again with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And in each case we can. However, there are still issues, and the tumor retention is relatively low. At 0.6% injected dose per gram, we need it to be significantly higher if it's going to really have clinical utility. Um, we need to reduce. This, this, this compound itself is rapidly cleared, um, which again, by slowing that clearance, uh, potentially we actually increase its, by in increase its circulation time, we actually have an increasing chance that it will bind granzyme Bs that are, have been released, and so therefore improving tumor retention or in the, in the region of tumor retention. And we would like to improve targeting a little better. I would love to show you 
will happen next, but I am not able to because it's part of an ongoing grant program, which actually ends it's got an extension, so it's going to end in the middle of this year. Um, but what I can say is that to do any one of these three things, and they're all interconnected, what we're able to do is actually modify this system or this, this parent molecule, improve its affinity for granzyme B, granzyme B uh, improve its circulation time, uh, and, in, and improve um, its clearance profile. So that is to come. But whilst we were waiting for that, we were also working with a group from the Nanyang Technical University who are particular experts in ion channels. Now, ion channels are something that always fascinated me. They're challenging um, imaging targets because you need very high specificity molecules, uh, ion, typically between ion channels, as they're so closely related. But we were working with Prof. George Chandy, who is a, a potassium ion expert. And whilst we were labeling a molecule, a peptide that he was interested in, and we did this by actually uh, changing uh, one of the peptide, uh, one of the amino acids in the peptide backbone for an, uh, an unnatural amino acid that actually considered, ha held an azido group, we were then able to use a radio labeled uh, strain cyclooctine molecule that would react instantaneously with that azide to label uh, a very complicated molecule, a very complicated peptide. Once we'd done this, we realized that we're targeting very specifically KV1.3. Now, KV1.3, and the more you talk with people, the better you learn, and George was saying, is intricately involved in a number of T cell activities. So we took the parent peptide, um, initially unbeknownst to George, uh, but then we started talking to him as we needed his help a lot more. And we made a very simple modification by putting our chelator on the N-terminus. Then we labeled with aluminium fluoride. And to distinguish ourselves from EGK5, uh, we called our, our new probe NOTA, which is the chelator, KCNA3P. KCNA3 being the gene that encodes for the, the, the channel itself, P for peptide. And the, the basis for wanting to use this in immunotherapy is really spelled out just in this diagram here with the T effect of memory cells. So one of the things we always need, uh, and again, this is simplistically, is a target to image, a target that your molecule can bind to preferentially that that target will be upregulated in disease process. So when KV1.3, so when um, T cells become um, KV1.3 uh, uh, dependent, as you progressively expose them to antigen, you get an upregulation of the KV1.3 channel from 250 per cell to 1500. This is an enormous upregulation. This means that at basal level, you've got a low target, but when an activated state, you've got a high target to aim at. So if you've got something, a molecule like this, that is highly selective for that target, and then in activated T cells, you have, or T effective memory cells, you have a huge target, but naturally you have a lower density target, then we, now we've got something that we can really go at. And just a very, very quick summary, but what we see here in a tumor non-responder, this is still the colon cancer model, is that we really get no uptake at all. In a PD-1, slight response, and we're starting to get uptake of, of our, our radio-labeled KCNA3P. And then in combination therapy, we're now getting extremely high uptake, but as you can see, this tumor size is, is reducing as, as actually they're responding to therapy. Importantly, now we're at about 1.5% injected dose per gram. Now this is starting to become clinically relevant in terms of the amount of uptake compared to, so there's a threefold increase between essentially the control and the tumor non-response to where you're seeing great response. So now we have a potential tool to actually differentiate between the non-responders and the responders uh, to these therapies. And as mentioned, the uptakes of those, those 
KV1.3 peptides are significantly improved over our granzyme B peptides. How long have I been going? Five minutes to go. So I did this um, when I came to Mitru uh, in March 2022. I had an opportunity to talk at a meeting and I massively overran. Um, I'm going to do this now. Actually, I want to tell you this one very quickly. So why do I, why do I really do this? So one of the things that I really, really enjoy about uh, radiopharmaceutical imaging, and particularly with the application to the clinic, is the difference you can actually make. Um, we had a big program in Singapore, our clinical imaging research center, uh, where we were approached by Changi General Hospital to see if we could make carbon-11 metomidate. Carbon-11 metomidate has the, uh, is, is, uh, is a radiopharmaceutical that we're going to use in this case to actually be able to distinguish people with curable hypertension. Hypertension, as I'm sure you're all aware, has massive health, long-term health impact. Um, but if you were, if your hypertension was caused by um, a curable, or through surgery, through surgery, a curable condition, you'd want to know. Um, and that's exactly what we we went to look at. So primary hyperaldosteronism um, is a common cause uh, cause of reversible hypertension, but uh, in Specifically in the case where you get unilateral disease, i.e. you get secreting adenomas on one of your adrenal glands and not both. Um, but fo following surgery, if you have unilateral disease, more than 99% of patients are cured from their hypertension, biochemically and chemically. So why, why, why use PET imaging? Um, well, the current standard of care is CT for localization. Uh, but then you have to do uh, sampling. So you actually sample via catheters inserted into the femoral veins and you sample one side adrenal, you sample the other side and you look at the ratio uh, of aldosterone and cortisol ratio on either side and this method is massively invasive. It requires an overnight stay in hospital um, and it's about 50 to 60 percent accurate. So that's not great odds if you're trying to determine whether your disease is, you, you're going to be cured or not. If you could do that with an outpatient um, uh, treatment where you come in, you get a PET scan, and that determines whether you're going to be uh, able to go for surgery or not, that would surely be far more uh, valuable uh, and far more uh, valuable to the community. And just very quickly, in this one example, you can see very much unilateral disease in this particular subject where you get a very high uptake on one side by comparison to the other and that was actually matched with the 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 AVS that was done um, but metomidate imaging is now used in Singapore at least under trial to actually dis dis uh, distinguish those that can go for surgery um, at the time of writing um, this particular slide, which is around the end of well, beginning of 2020, um, we actually had presented out as our first in Asia study, um, and the program was due to be rolled out in 2022, 23 across all of the health um, uh, the healthcare system in Singapore. Um, we have now found more than 50 subjects in CERC, and this is going to be expanded to more than 100. And of course, we were then featured in our local paper. Um, and one of the things I was going to say, Straits Times is, you know, the, the be all and end all of information in Singapore. But I now understand from reading this morning, they've been overinflating their uh, readership by about 10%. But we managed to reach a lot of people. Uh, and from this article, um, we then got a lot of people coming to us saying, can we have this scan? Uh, because when you see a headline like, patients may soon have new access to a scan uh, to identify those with curable hypertension, people are going to want to use that. The problem is it's still clinical research. Translation still takes a very long time. Talking about long time translation, two molecules that you guys may be familiar with, um, amyloid tracer, tau tracer, these belong to a group called Enigma. 
Uh, they've gone around the world looking for academic sites to do the manufacturing of these two radiopharmaceuticals to support a major program, which is Lincanimab, which is the ESI uh, pharmaceutical that is starting to show efficacy in slowing the Alzheimer's disease. We had an agreement with Enigma in Singapore. We have an agreement with Enigma um, uh, with Mitru to be manufacturing these. And MK is currently under validation and we're soon to be moving on to NAV. Uh, so those radiopharmaceuticals will now be, will become part of what Mitru has to offer. And ultimately that will get Mitru and Samri to be part of a head, the head study, ABNET across Australia, etc. So then that again is how we can have value in the clinic going forward. As mentioned, Mitru, clinical supply, this is something from an FDG perspective they've been doing phenomenally well. Uh, they've been supporting clinical trials of early phase radiopharmaceuticals and now we want to bolster that with early phase, earlier phase, preclinical research. Um, and to be able to do this, I need to interact with Samri from ideas grants to companies, whether it be Interferon Gamma or CD4, which is Imaginab. They're a company that want to come work with us here in Australia. They want to know if people are interested in Interferon Gamma or CD4 or potentially CD8. We need to work with the universities. Uh, company I'm talking to this afternoon, Glypican 1 is their radio pharma, they have a radio pharmaceutical for Glypican 1 expressed on many solid tumors, in particular prostate cancer uh, and gliomas. We're already working with people like Telix and Clarity. These are um, world leaders right now in terms of the development of radio pharmaceuticals. And as mentioned, Enigma with clinical trials in hospitals and drug trials, as well as industry alignment programs. So this is how I see us going forward. I'm sorry, I really rushed through that last part because again, I've over, over spoken. I need probably two or three more of these and then I can talk to you about some chemistry actually at some point. Um, but there are so many people that I need to thank, whether they be from ASTAR or NUS, uh, collaborators and colleagues alike, clinicians, of course, and also the many different funding agencies, and HMRC is here, and MRC is in Singapore, and the IAF, the Industry Alignment Fund, and of course ASTAR, but most of all, thank you, and I apologize for going slightly over. Thanks, thanks, Ed, for a terrific talk, and um, I do think we have a few minutes for questions, so are there any questions from the audience? Tim, uh, there's a talk. Uh, Renzyme, that looks very promising. Is it very much time dependent? I mean, did you have to sort of jump in at a certain time or does that all sort of wash out within a few hours or? Do you no, know that? that's, that's a good question actually, because one of the things that um, we wanted to understand was um, when do we get, start getting a decent signal from Granzyme B? In fact, in the animal models we've been looking at, it's after the first dose of therapy, we start getting a signal. Um, there actually ha is a problem later down the road. Um, if, you, if you allow your tumors to grow and actually start to go a little bit uh, uh, hypoxic and you get necrosis, you actually start getting breakdown. The breakdown starts to release granzyme B. So you can start to get f further down the road. It, it makes it more difficult to understand your imaging. But one of the, the, the advantages of, of being able to identify granzyme B being present after a single dose is that if you translate that to a clinic, someone is referred to get immunotherapy, um, you can check very soon after they've, they've received their first dose. The, the, the whole uh, or the original idea around PD-1 imaging or pd one imaging was to understand if people were going to be susceptible to that immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, great, it'd be fantastic to have a purely diagnostic test, um, but that's proven very difficult. Um, we've got a, the next best thing, which is once you've gone down that path, you can check very quickly to see if it's actually working or not. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, 
as you know, I've always been interested in the MK and NAV. Yes. So what what's the timeline on those being <laughs> made available, Ed? Matt? Um, <laughs> no, so um, MK is, is um, the, from the method development point of view, um, it's done. We're now working through the documentation to ensure that our chemical manufacturing control docs that we'll need to submit uh, not only to Enigma, uh, but as part of any clinical trial, uh, are going to are properly conceived. So we're looking at, a few, I would say, what, one to two months for MK and for NAV to be slightly later in the year, so towards Q3, I would hope. Okay, it's terrific because, you know, obviously there's a big interest in dementia both in this building and in the state and also in the treatment trial, well, the potential treatment trials, yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions? Um, if not, there is some um, sandwiches at the back and Ed will be around, so um, accost him and talk to him about your interests. And, uh, and again, just emphasise um, what we actually do have available now, obviously Mitru doing fabulous research and production, obviously human imaging in Crick and small animal imaging, but importantly, we do have the large animal PET CT, one of the, I think the only in the country or one of two in the country. Um, and as Ed said, there's a sheep study happening right now uh, or very shortly. And um, so that capacity to test or to look at large animals, um, pigs and sheep, is pretty unique. So something that yeah. people should think about as well. Um, Anything else? No? If we will stop there and thank Ed again for a terrific talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.